Hello and welcome back to my channel. Here's socks and me and a giant cup of coffee. Um, it's Bank Holiday Monday. And I wasn't going to talk about much, but actually I've got stuff to talk about. <laughs> Books to talk about, oddly enough. Um, God, I look tired. <laughs> We've been out and about and socialising. We've been to a music festival, Party in the Pews, on uh, in Macclesfield, which is organised by a lovely friend of ours. And we saw bands in a church, and Jeremy DJed in a church. Um, and I saw a band, and I thought, I recognise every single one of these songs. <laughs> That's a bit vague. I'd been drawing um, everything that was going on, sitting in the pews, and then realised that this slightly older fellow jumping up and down and singing was singing songs that were familiar. And I kind of Googled him and the band he was with and realised it was... Um, uh, Tom Hingley, uh, who was the singer with In Spiral Carpets, and he was singing all their songs. And when I looked up, when I might have last seen the In Spiral Carpets, it turned out to be the 26th of October, 1989, 35 years earlier. So that was that was quite a moment, quite a moving moment, watching all these slightly older people jumping up and down in a church in Macclesfield on a beautiful summer's evening and realising how long ago I'd last seen this person singing. Um, all of his band members were younger <laughs> than the length of time it was since I'd last seen this, this singer perform. He was really good. And before he started, he went round giving out stickers with um, uh, Richard Bryars from The Good Life on, which was marvellous. Um, Richard Bryars turned up last night in the film I was watching. It's, uh, I must tell you, because I don't think anybody knows about this film, because I certainly didn't. P.J. Hogan, who made Muriel's Wedding, my favourite movie in the world. He made that in 93, but 10 years later, he made an American movie um, called Unconditional Love. He all, he'd also made My Best Friend's Wedding uh, with, uh, uh, I forget the name, Julia, what's it? Which I rewatched and I don't like so much, really. But Unconditional Love has Kathy Bates and this cast of cameos and characters. And um, it just, it's a ludicrous romp that goes across so many lines of, of genre, of romantic comedy and thriller and screwball caper and black comedy. And um, it's got cameos by people like Julie Andrews and Barry Manilow. <laughs> and it, it just turned into one of my favourite films ever. The link being um, uh, with what I was just saying. What was it? Oh, I did have a good link <laughs> to do with um, people you're not expecting to be in things. Oh, never mind. Maybe it was Kathy Bates. I can't remember. Anyway, it was a good recommendation of a fantastic film, Unconditional Love. Look, Sox is sitting up, Unconditional Love, speaking of which, with his ears there, expecting just to be booped and to have his ears stroked all day long. I wonder what it was that I meant as a link. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I told you I was tired on bank holiday. Anyway, it's a great film, and you must, you must go and see it. Um, right. So, book haul, a very small book haul because uh, I've had a few things in the post. I went to uh, eBay when I was thinking about lovely David Rees, who's in the tent. Um, book I read as a kid, a kind of a gay novel for teens, and I thought. I've got some of his other adult books, not many. I'd collected them from kind of small, gay small presses in the 80s. And then um, I went looking up to see what else was available on YouTube. And The Colour of His Hair is a novel from, I think, the late 80s when he'd returned to writing for, uh, I think, a later teen audience. 89, you see, so by then I was at university and it would have been astonishing to find another novel by him in this line because the gap for me from kind of 81 to 89 was was immense. It was my whole growing up. Uh, and I found on eBay 
this lovely slim hardback, a kid's book, middle grade, um, the night before Christmas Eve. Now, anybody knows who knows me, I absolutely love books about Christmas and especially slightly spooky books about Christmas. This is a small village. I read it straight away. Um, a small village. It's from 1970. No, hang on. Very early 80s. A snowy village and a teen boy and his parents. And while the father's out on the night before Christmas Eve, the son and the mother are held hostage by an escaped criminal. And it's a very quick, suspenseful book with a very kind of almost Fosterian ending about the boy's conscience and how he'd made this connection of sympathy, of empathy with this man escaping across the fields <clears throat> and how he eventually gets picked up again by the authorities and all he wanted was, was Christmas with his own son. Um, so tenderly done, so economically done. I think David Rees is a wonderful writer and I'll be looking for even more by him that I, than um, I've already found. Digging around in the house, I found this collection, Flux, um, not to be confused with the uh, ludicrously, wonderfully bad season of Doctor Who a few years ago called Flux. Um, this is a collection of stories from the 1980s, I think. And, yeah, late 80s. He was quite um, prolific. And he worked with these fairly small presses. This is uh, Third House, so I don't know who they are. See, it was a different world in which there were all kinds of different imprints and presses, some of them quite small, before all the corporate giants just ate up everything like Pac-Man and destroyed publishing. Anyway, well, destroyed publishing in the sense that, you know, readers lost out and writers lost out. Publishing's doing fine. The The, the huge profits announced by fiction publishers uh, in recent weeks are revolting compared with you know what has actually happened to the livelihoods and livings made by actual writers um, it's appalling they suck <laughs> the greedy bastards right now what have i been reading oh there's something else uh, first of all uh Uncle Paul, I've been waiting to get hold of this. I almost bought it uh, new and then somehow forgot. And it's a, a reprint, Faber, who uh, I don't always trust in their choices about things. But this is by Celia Fremlin. And it's from, I think, the 50s, 59. And it's because of the vogue, the, the current vogue in, in Cozy Mysteries. They've brought her back. And this is a seaside set uh, holiday crime story. The holidays have begun in a seaside caravan resort. Isabel and her sister Meg build sandcastles with the children, navigate deck chair politics, explore the pier's delights, gorge on ice cream in the sun. But their half-sister Mildred has returned to a nearby coastal cottage where her husband, the mysterious Uncle Paul, was arrested for the attempted murder of his first wife. Now on his release from prison... Is Uncle Paul returning for revenge, seeking who betrayed him, uncovering the family's skeletons? Or are all three women letting their nerves get the better of them? Though, who really is Meg's new lover? And whose are those footsteps? It sounds fantastic. That could almost be the synopsis of every story I enjoy reading and or writing. That line about, are all three women letting their nerves get the better of them is very funny. Right, so that's on the um, the immense reading pile. It'll be a nice summary read, perhaps, but then everything I've got lined up on these shelves would be a great summary read. I keep rearranging what comes next. And I'm working my way through very slowly. I finished this at last. Bookshops and Bone Dust. It took a few more days than I expected. I just love the production of this. Look at the end papers with Viv in the bookshop that she um, where she makes new friends. These kind of um, fantasy creatures in this epic fantasy world where she lives, where you have monsters and curses and swords and battles and quests, but you also have bookshops and bakeries and um, coffee shops. I really loved the one that I read last year. 
Legends and Lattes. This is a prequel and I felt thwarted by it. I really wanted to like it, but I found it tough going in places. It felt like it had all the right elements, um, but it was less than the sum of its parts. It had the cosy bookshop. It had the um, cosy bookshop book shop owner. <laughs> I don't know why I'm putting so many words in my sentences. It had the bookshop owner who needs help to um, to get rid of the stock, to clean up, to paint. It has a weird kind of owl dog pet who's very cute. Um, there are various gruff um, characters around the place. The one who owns the bakery, the person who has the... I think that one of the problems for me was all the secondary characters became a bit interchangeable. They were all gruff, slightly closeted lesbians. <laughs> that was that was the character notes for everybody. And I don't understand why there wasn't more variety in the types of people that, that Viv was meeting. And they all talk in the same, a similar kind of way. <clears throat> There's a lovely speaking homunculus called Satchel, a kind of animated ske uh, skeleton that comes to life and helps out and has to hide away when various people visit. And there's a quite vivacious novelist who arrives for a, 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 a book signing. And putting all those things together, just telling those bits, it sounds wonderful. Again, all the parts sound right, but it felt kind of slightly inert to me. And when you read the afterward, there's some talk from the author about it being a difficult second book and you can kind of, I think you can kind of tell uh I just wanted to give it a a boot up the arse and tell it to, to get going and enjoy itself more it felt like it hadn't been joyful I think that's what it is and I can tell that I can tell when there isn't um I think pleasure in the, in in the writing because if the writer doesn't enjoy it the reader's not going to enjoy it. That's what I feel. What's the point otherwise? So it felt a bit as if there was a, a, a weight of obligation. And I felt obliged to finish it because I'd enjoyed the first one so much. I'm going to start feeling less obliged to finish things, I think. Or less obliged to try to enjoy things. If it's not reaching out to me, I'm not going <laughs> to try as hard as that. I won't do it again with, with this particular series. I'll try the next one, but... If it's not, if it doesn't fill me with joy, it's the Marie Kondo thing. It's off. It's going. I just subscribed to Raw Vision, which I've meant to do for ages and ages. It's the journal of um, outsider art. And I kept getting adverts and I've got friends who talk about it. And it's the most lavishly, beautifully produced magazine um, connected to galleries and collections all over the world. I have a thing about outsider art, about untrained. In the past, there would have been called naive artists. So there's nothing naive about these. They're kind of often troubled souls in various ways. But people who rejoice in their work, there's a theme coming out. Outsider artists, nobody's asked them to do this stuff. They just produce work. Despite the world, despite the world saying what is good, what is right, what is um, proper art. And these people just, there's a fellow with his council house down south in England, painting. Late in life, he came to painting, painting frescoes and um, classical subjects on every spare corner of his council house. You know, one day the council will take the house back and paint over, but it just doesn't stop him. Look at the determination in his face there. These are people who, for the sake of the joy they find in the things they do, break all the rules without even knowing there were rules. It's the very opposite of corporate artwork, of people who um, uh, glibly professionalise everything and lose the sense of why they loved what they did why they love the thing they're doing in the first place. Um, but look at them. This is somebody who takes photos of outsider art, artists, um, which is its own kind of collection of things. I love this. These kind of bricolaged pieces of 
um, bits of toys and ephemera. I've seen a few exhibitions like that. There was one exhibition in a cafe in Canal Street in Taurus, which is long gone now. And it was all made from toys, kind of um, bits of plastic toys and things you get in crackers and McDonald's Happy Meals. And these they made these wonderful collages, 3D collages that were on the wall. And I wish I'd bought one now. This is a quite a young person. And she pours over these amazing drawings that are just like something out of, I don't know, Hellraiser. Um, and this fellow who does science fiction drawings of all the books he ever read in what looks like to me like coloured pencil on, on paper. I love the uh, respectfulness with which their work is is shown. You know, this is a proper art journal. And there's something very moving. I love this woman. She's She died in her 90s and she was from Sardinia and painted like Chagall, naturally. You know, these floating animals and, and trees and farmlands all over the rooms of her house. Again, painting on, on the walls of her home. So the environment becomes an artwork. Anyway, that's my new subscription, four times a year. I subscribe to fewer things now. I used to have all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> now I get the New Yorker Weekly every week uh, in its print form, and, and now Raw Vision as well. Oh, and Stand Magazine, which is a, um, a long-running literary magazine out of Leeds. Although I'm trying to to stop that subscription. It's quite hard once you subscribe to things to find the thing that allows you to stop. <laughs> I've got enough issues of stand for now. Um, it's mostly poetry. And uh, uh, yeah, I've got enough issues to be going on with. I read this uh, this week as well. Um, I think because I was reordering bookcases in the hall. Um, for some reason this leapt out. I was thinking about a certain era of science fiction, 80s science fiction for kids. And um, this is Louise Lawrence calling B for Butterfly. And I don't know why I had it in the first place. I think somebody recommended it and I bought it and it went on the pile and then I forgot. This is such a nicely produced book. The paper and everything is just expensive. It's published by, I don't know what BH is. Um... I can't even see from that. Anyway, who's the publisher? Bodley Head. So it was a fancy, a fancy press. All of her titles sound wonderful. Um, they're kind of space operas, but usually involving younger characters. Uh, and they're called things like Children of the Dust, Moonwind, Star Lord, The Warriors of Tarn. This is about a colony ship heading through the solar system where there's a terrible accident and... 2,000 passengers are killed and blown out into space. And six children, one of them a baby, remain. Oh, and one nebulous presence. Um, and they, they're in the kind of shuttle, the emergency shuttle, and they can't pilot it by themselves. They're in touch with uh, humans on a satellite or a moon somewhere. And they try and maintain this link. But the thing is, it's, it's the writing is so descriptive and so beautiful. And although I found it quite hard to differentiate between some of the characters because it's so sparely written and so fast, uh, and the kids are all surly with each other, which and they fall out and they fight, even when the clock is ticking towards doom. And I thought that was very true to life. But it is hard to follow in places, I think. Um, but I found the writing absolutely wonderful. It's so lush, I think, and exact. So I want to read more of Louise Lawrence. And at the moment, this is what I'm reading for book club next week. We decided we wanted a, a, um, a murder book because Caroline's very keen on murder books. I love thrillers in this kind of genre as well. It's The Couple, next, uh, the couple at Number Nine by Claire Douglas. So I'm about a third of the way through that bodies found in a back garden of this idyllic cottage 
that our lead character, uh, Safi, has uh, inherited from her grandmother, who's now got Alzheimer's. So it's all about suppressed memories and hidden secrets in the past, who ended up uh, buried in the garden. And it it's just written so smoothly, so well, um, that you just kind of shoot through the book. So that's quite good for a bank holiday afternoon with the cat falling asleep on you. I hope all you lot are reading nice things and enjoying uh, enjoying your days. It's still pouring down. I'm hoping for sun. We sat in the garden all day yesterday afternoon for our uh, writing group meeting. We have a gay men's writing group locally, Fambles, and it was our turn to host. And the six of us managed to sit outside for about six hours and talk about writing until the rain started and it got too cold. But it feels like a triumph to be able to sit outside with lots of food and, and cups of tea for that long. Anyway, I'm not sure we'll get out this afternoon. I'm happy enough sat here with socks and my uh, murdery book <laughs> and then ready to go on to the next thing, whatever that turns out to be. Possibly Armistead Maupin. He's waiting. Whoops. Oh, no. He's waiting here. I've also got the uh, Catherine Rundell Impossible Creatures, which has been waiting around for ages. This book about Grace Jones that uh, Dave Haslam published recently out of Stockport. And uh, <laughs> I'm still waiting to read my Daphne and Velma mystery novel. The Scooby Doo book without Scooby Doo, which I'm still dubious about. Uh, yeah, and it just goes on and on and on. Heaps and heaps of books to read. I will never, ever run out, and I'm very happy about that. I'm actually filming this on my iPad rather than my phone because my phone's out of charge. So we'll see if this works. I hope it does, otherwise I've talked. <laughs> I've talked for 22 minutes to no effect. It might be true anyway. I still wish I could remember what the connection was between seeing the spiral carpets and watching Kathy Bates in a movie. Maybe it's just things that I enjoyed at the weekend. Anyway, hope you're well. Please subscribe if you haven't already and go and look at my Patreon page and I will see you soon again in the next uh, episode. Okay. This is really clumsy but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna click off. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> it's not very smart.